start off our second panel here. So this second panel deals with health and medicine and the integration of health and medicine with 3D printing. Um, from closest to me, I guess you also left to right, uh, we first have, yeah, left to right, first have Dr. Daryl Hurt. Uh, Hurt is the chief acting of the Bioinformatics and Computational Biosciences Branch in the Office of Cyber Infrastructure and Computational Biology at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hurt also leads the NIH 3D Print Exchange, an online portal to open source data and tools for discovering, creating, and sharing 3D printable models related to biomedical science. And the goal of this exchange is to provide researchers, physicians, and the public with high quality informative models that inspire new discoveries that transform science and healthcare. Dr. Hurst's research background focuses on computational and structural biology and provides special expertise in 3D printing, visualization, and modeling. Um, so his background includes uh, Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, uh, Master of Science and PhD uh, in Chemistry, right? That's right? Let's see, his doctoral work was recognized with the Pauling Award from the American uh, Crystallographic Association, and he's the author of several scientific research articles. Next to uh, Dr. Hurt is John Scholes, the founder of Enable. And Enable is a service where volunteers can design and deliver free 3D printing prosthetics worldwide, such as Dr. Scholl is explaining right now. So I, I realized last night when going over some of the material that this panel features all PhDs, uh, so I feel, <laughs> feel honored to moderate, and I will do my best to sound intelligent. Uh, we'll ask you more questions. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Scholl's background is a biological psychologist, inventor, entrepreneur, and human-computer interaction researcher, and digital community organizer. He is the creator of Enable, as I mentioned, an online philanthropic community that designs, customizes, and fabricates open-source affordable 3D printed prosthetic hands and arms for children and adults with upper limb uh, differences. Next, Dr. Scholl is Dr. Matthew Kramer. Dr. Kramer received his bachelor's in material science and engineering from Rice University. So uh, we managed to pair him next to a fellow Rice University alum, Jordan Miller. Uh, and he works as a regulatory scientist at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health in the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. I realize that the two government staffers have the longest titles for the office. <laughs> That's the way it is. Yeah. Among his many duties, he's the head of the Additive Manufacturing Working Group, which is spearheading efforts across the agency to address how this technology affects medical devices and other uh, medical products. These efforts include guidance and standard development, device review, harmonization, and performing regulatory science with the intent to foster innovative and high-quality products. Lastly, we have Jordan Miller. Uh, Dr. Jordan Miller is the uh, Assistant Professor of Bioengineering at Rice University and no stranger to us, public knowledge of the UDC. I think he is a three-time UDC attendee, uh, so we thank you for joining us again. His primary research interests uh, deal with regenerative medicine and combines synthetic chemistry, three-dimensional printing, microfabrication, and molecular imaging to direct cultured human cells to form more complex organizations of living vessels and tissues. Uh, so his research projects also explore the mass transport of cell survival and matrix model in a 3D context. So we wanted to create this panel and bring these panelists uh, to the DC because I know for me a lot of the most exciting news that I read about 3D printing involves medicine, involves health, involves people uh, using 3D printing, 3D scanning technologies to take a more proactive control of their health. And Project Enable uh, obviously has uh, is very popular and known worldwide. Uh, when Mike and I were planning this. It was a video that came out with Robert Downey Jr. Uh, working with a seven-year-old uh, to have a prosthetic limb and you know, his Iron Man and Tony Stark guys. Uh, but we want to see what this looks like from the perspective of you know, those scientists who work in federal agencies or those researchers who you know, have educational background and are in academia and what the intersection of academia and government currently is and what we you know, predict it will be. Um, and also, what are some challenges that we're facing right now? because we want to make sure that staffers and other members of the public who follow tech policy, 3D printing policy, um, not only have that excitement that we have in seeing those headlines, um, those you know, heartrending stories, but also what other realistic reputations we have moving forward. So I'll let the panelists you know, deliver remarks about five, seven minutes in terms of what they're doing in this field, and then we'll have a few questions, and then we'll open up questions to the audience. So, please.
Okay, I guess, I guess I'm first. Um, so again, my name is Daryl Hurt, and I lead the NIH 3D Print Exchange project, which was really just kind of the culmination of an idea that started uh, back in 2007, where we first uh, considered using 3D printing to describe our very complicated three-dimensional structures that, that are inside of all of us, the, the proteins and enzymes that make us living things. It's a very complicated shapes, incredibly small. We can't see them, not even on a microscope. And so it's really important to be able to understand these structures because basically all medicines, all drugs, all vaccines work on that molecular level. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could understand them better and therefore do better science? That was my thought. And so we, we got a 3D printer and I started to work out kind, kind of the technological problems associated with transforming scientific data into 3D printable files. And then along came an opportunity to actually share that knowledge, that those recipes that, um, that would take me, you know, even though I knew what I was doing, uh, an hour or more to do to automate that and democratize it. That is, get it out into a public venue where anybody could be able to run these same um, recipes, computational recipes, with their own data, whether it be uh, you know, something from a microscope, something from molecular, and even uh, share their, their lab tools that they might be creating, unbeknownst to anybody else, custom labware that enables them to do better science, and even uh, their own biomedical data, so a CT scan, for example. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting if you happen to get a CT scan, say, of your arm to put it in and uh, have our tools generate a 3D model for you. That's what the 3D Print Exchange is. It's a place to, to uh, share and create 3D printable models and put into the hands of people more tools than they would have otherwise. Uh, but it's become much more than that, actually. A 3D Print Exchange uh, really is an opportunity to work with and become associated with some of really fantastic people, including people who are here on the panel with me. In fact, I feel like, uh, despite uh, all the PhDs on the panel here, that uh, I, am, I am the young one here, and uh, although I may be older than some of these things. But uh, <laughs> uh, in that, uh, really, a lot of the innovation is happening in, uh, in these labs, and we're just uh, happy that uh, our services, our work, <coughs> is being adopted and is looking as a, a place for people to share and exchange ideas as well as their models. It's really become an example of how government agencies can work across agencies and across different uh, domains of, of knowledge to accomplish something much greater than anyone could by themselves. And we're, we're so happy, again, to have uh, actually John Scholl as one of our contributors uh, on the exchange. So John, why don't you take that? Thank you very much. So yeah, we're very happy to be on the exchange. Um, we are as of last week, a 5,000-member volunteer community um, all over the world using 3D printers to produce these devices, to design these devices, to share these devices, and then to give them away for free. Um, we are a really open community, creating open designs with open arms and hands. And, you know, we, we didn't exist two years ago. Um, and at this point, we have talked to other members, we've delivered over 1,500 hands to hundreds of children and families, we've gotten a vast amount of press, independent of Robert Downey Jr. and, and <laughs> Iron Man. Uh, and it's become something of a movement in two short years. And it occurs to me that one of the reasons we were able to do that is because of all of that openness and the fact that we found a way of skirting the usual hoops and hurdles that academia and government and business and contracts um, usually put in the way of actually getting a job done. Um, our devices are free. Uh, that means they are what, whereas medically approved, FDA regulated, commercially available devices, which are much better devices uh, mechanically and probably functionally, but they cost, you know, five to twenty or more thousand dollars. Um, free is infinitely cheaper, no matter what the commercial 
um, price is. Um, and for the people we've focused on to begin with, children, um, our lightweight plastic superhero size, you know, shaped and themed pants are the cat's meow. They're just, uh, they, they don't actually like wearing the commercial medical prosthetics. So it's an interesting um, story about the intrinsic costs of safety and regulation and business and contracts. And yet, we are very conscious that we could potentially do harm. We are disrupting existing industries that serve a really important purpose, um, that there are intellectual property um, as well as social responsibility issues. And while we, you know, we used to say that our strategy was to make sure that the horse got way out of the barn before anybody noticed, um, at this point we're part of a really interesting developing ecology in which I think all parties um, like what's going on and are being very careful to try not to step on each other's toes. Thank you, John. That's actually a really good segue for me to talk about what we're doing at the FDA. So uh, as uh, Martin mentioned, I'm the head of the Additive Manufacturing Working Group, which is based out of the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Uh, most of all the 3D, most 3D printed medical products have come in as medical devices, so my center is taking the lead. We currently have a team of 58 people who are spread across all different specialties within the FDA, including, including people from the biologics and devices, uh, sorry, drugs centers. So we have a lot of expertise that we're brought in, and we're primarily interested in how does additively manufacturing of medical product sort of affect what testing and safety requirements there are. So we like to say that most of this is on the technical side. The regulations don't stipulate how you make a device. Right? So the FDA, if you mill it, cast it, or if you 3D print it, it can go through the same regulatory processes. Now, we care about what the risk is to the patient, what the benefit is, uh, indications for use, and anatomical location and claims. Now, this last couple are really sort of FDA specific, but if you're making a medical product, we worry about that on the product. That being said, as you heard earlier, there are all sorts of sort of challenges and consistent parts. You know, how you handle uh, the material properties, especially for 3D printing when you're printing metal. Right? It used to be you'd go to the store, buy a block of steel, you know what grade of steel that is, you know it should have consistent properties. When you're doing metal 3D printing, you start with the powder. Based on powder, that can change from your final properties. And you're creating your final alloy sometimes, even at the same time you're creating that part. So what sort of technical questions you know, do we have to have companies show to us to make sure that that product is going to perform as expected? And what sort of validation requirements do they need to do? You know, there's this trade-off between validation and verification. Right? Uh, GE, when they're making their fuel injector nozzles, they're testing every single part. Right? And they're doing that because they know if one of these fails, it's going to be over for them in 3D printing. Uh, that's not feasible, nor is it necessary for every kind of device. So there's this sort of trade-off that we're looking at on the technical side between how well can you validate a system and how much verification you need. So there's been a lot of sort of fundamental research we've been going on seeing how do properties change as you change the orientation with your print space. Right? If you go to LaraWise, they have some awesome images showing how you can stack parts in, di in different locations of your print space to maximize your build volume. Well, if you're doing that, you know, are there any trade-offs on mechanical properties, fatigue, um, you know, part consolidation? So this is primarily sort of what our group is focused on. Now, my background is material science. My PhD was heavy in thermal mechanics. I usually default to the mechanics and material properties of issues, but we have people looking at the compatibility. How do you clean something that's coming out of powder, polymer? You know, if you have an FDM and you have a sacrificial layer, how do you make sure you get all that off? So there's a lot of different specialties involved in looking at this technology to make sure it's brought to the consumer in the, the safest way possible. So uh, the last sort of story I'll tell is something my boss says. And you know, he says, you know, everyone has a microwave oven in their house, as I mentioned earlier. You know, 30, 40 years ago, I mean, could you imagine going someone saying, you're going to cook food with radiation. And you're going to have this radiation source in every kitchen. 
Right? The company that messes that up could have kept microwaves from being as ubiquitous as they are now. So we're spending a lot of time right now to make sure that added manufacturing can you know, present the full benefit to the American public uh, by making these innovative uh, medical devices. All right, thank you all. Um, so uh, I'm Jordan Miller, I'm assistant professor of bioengineering at Rice University, and I'm running a, a research lab focused on bioprinting. So why do we need bioprinting? So uh, if you fall down and you skin your knee, you get a scar that forms. And actually the same thing happens to our internal organs. When they get damaged sufficiently, they cannot regenerate. So uh, like cirrhosis in a liver that is full of scar tissue that is non-functional. And uh, in the short term, we have uh, organ donations and transplantations, and those are the gold standard. And those are really critical. We need a lot more people in the short term to be registered to donate organs when, uh, when needed. But we're, uh, in our lab, we're focused on the long term, trying to figure out, are there technologies we can build in the lab that could take a sample of a patient's own cells and be able to recreate an organ for them that would be functional and could replace function? Uh, uh, in the long term, and that maybe if they get it when they're young, that it could grow with them if it's made from their own cells. Um, so I think uh, we can talk a lot about which are the technologies we're using to do that. I think one of the most in important things that we're doing is actually the approach that we're taking towards this goal, um, and it's one of openness. And I think that uh, science and uh, open source technology are inherently tied together. Um, science has historically always been about openness and about trying to describe your experiments so that other people can reproduce it. And I think a lot of the things that, are, that we're seeing on the panel today, things like the NIH 3D Print Exchange, where it's helping people to standardize things in this virtual field. So, you know, bioprinting has been around for 10 or 15 years. Why hasn't it really taken off? One of our theories about this is we don't have standards in our field yet. We don't have standard bioprinters themselves. We don't know how to build them the same way from lab to lab. Uh, we don't have a file format for a human organ. What is the architecture of the organ that you need? What are the cell types you need? What are the materials you need to put down? Um, these are things that we're trying to figure out. A lot of people in our field are trying to figure out. But uh, whoever gets there first, we believe the only way to bring everyone there is to do it in an open way. So I'm very interested in seeing uh, and talking about more of the, the openness that Congress has been uh, mandating and encouraging through uh, incentives, things like through the NIH and the NSF, through uh, during funding, uh, through grants that you say, well, when you publish something, you need to put your data in an open way, and I think that's really going to help our field. You're seeing that really accelerate a lot of the things that we're doing, um, and we're really excited to be part of it. So. Excellent. Thank you all very much for your remarks. Um, I want to start with a question by asking, particularly uh, Matthew, Daryl, to what extent are you all um, working with other fellow agencies? What are some of the other fellow agencies you're working with that you mentioned um, 3D printing throughout the government? And Follow-up question, to what extent are you working with you know, academic institutions, universities like Rice University, or other educational institutions? Sure. Thanks, John. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work backwards sure, there. Sure, so sure, sure. the very first thing we did for the print exchange was identify a, a nationwide network of experts in 3D printing, in particular for the kinds of 3D printing that we wanted to do, which was less of the bioprinting, although that is on our mind, Jordan. <laughs> uh, as uh, you know, the kind of printing that is used in, in more educational spaces. And trying to get feedback from them uh, on our ideas, on the presentation of those ideas, uh, on how open the data should be, the algorithms and recipes we were using. Uh, and those people have continued actually with us and are some of our advisors uh, for the project. And some of our cross-government uh, collaborations have really happened because we were fortunate enough to receive uh, so-called air cover from the highest levels at uh, HHS through their so-called idea lab, which is a place to kind of kickstart uh, ideas that wouldn't necessarily get uh, funded or backed in other ways, but uh, if you have a good idea, you can propose it to them and they'll give you a little bit of money and a lot of air cover to do what you need to do. And so in this way, kind of like uh, John was talking about, trying to get, you know, work away uh, kind of around the hoops and red tape. And in fact, uh, early on, one of our developers, who has been a government employee for a long time and developed lots of software for the government, told us, you guys are breaking all the rules. <laughs> and and that this was, this was somehow wrong. And yet, 
um, we were able to stand up, I think, a pretty, uh, pretty nice product with global reach and large impact, one of the largest uh, um, things that our institute has ever done in terms of global facing uh, tools is, uh, is because we broke those rules. And, and we did it in, in about a year, a year and a half maybe. Uh, through the HHS, that air cover, and through some context provided by, by Jordan, the office of White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, got hold of us. And since that time, we've had contacts with, uh, the, with NIST, with uh, the military, various branches of the military, in fact, uh, with, uh, the, within HHS, the CDC, and the FDA to, to some degree, also the Department of Education, and several other uh, government agencies, not at the uh, uh, Department or the Secretary level, the Cabinet level. So uh, one of the things that has really come out of this is that something we never anticipated, but uh, because I guess we're at the nexus of a lot of these things, people look to the 3D print exchange as uh, almost experts on 3D printing in the government, and we're scrambling to keep up. <laughs> Uh, and I, we could share some more thoughts on that, but I'll, I'll pass it over okay. to Matt. So my story is going to be fairly similar. Uh, the FDA is uh, in close contact with NIST and NIH for a couple within a couple of different groups for a couple of different projects. There's also a government-wide additive manufacturing group called Go Additive, which was a way for all the different government groups involved in this field to sort of pool resources, pool knowledge, talk about joint sort of uh, challenges facing everyone. You know, a lot of the same issues that the FDA looks at in terms of uh, medical device quality, the FAA is asking the exact same questions in terms of flight readiness. So there's a lot sort of going on at that level for us to make sure that we're not doing anything too duplicative and everyone's aware of the research projects and resources available within the government that's working on additive manufacturing. Uh, <coughs> FDA is also heavily involved with standards organizations, which is usually a mix of other government agencies, industry, and academia. Uh, so we're involved in uh, ASTM, specifically ASTM Committee F42 for additive uh, technologies where we're hoping to develop some of the standards, and again, biology and biological standards much further away, but we're working on creating standards to assist the industry with understanding what you need to do when printing devices. Uh, in terms of universities and academia, you know, the FDA has a research wing, which is uh, where I'm based out of. So we have uh, industry, or academic uh, collaborators on projects. We often invite uh, academics to come talk about the research they're doing. So we can understand what's coming next and where they see the uh, technology going. So you know, we do more with government and then standards organizations, but we are tied in with some universities. Thank you. Uh, and to John, the uh, question I'm going to ask you is, what are some of your goals for Enable? I mean, you said 5,000 members over the past two years, so it's you know, obviously exploded in a great way. Um, you know, but how did you, was this, was this what you envisioned when you originally started out, and where do you see it going forward? Um, you know, some of us live in a fantasy world, so I'm not going to talk about what I envisioned okay. uh, early on. It, it wasn't this, but um, you, know, you do this kind of thing because it could become something like this. Um, you know, it's, it's a little odd to say, but I think these are plausible goals for Enable right now. In the, the first goal is I think that we could create a situation in which inexpensive prosthetics are available to everyone everywhere. We're, we're sort of on track. And that may put us, uh, put our initial mission out of business in five to ten years when uh, 3D printers are as ubiquitous as, uh, as you know, laser printers. Microwaves. Or microwaves, <laughs> that's right. Um, but there's, there's that one. The, the other thing we're trying to do is to nurture, support, and celebrate a global community of volunteers using emerging technologies to develop innovative new solutions for underserved populations. You know, we're already ready to walk away from 3D printers and prosthetics because that sort of social model is of hands across the ocean, if you will, helping hands for the greater good, is also a really big um, mission for this kind of thing, and 3D printing of prosthetic hands and other 
3D printing of other assistive technologies and development of other, other kinds of assistive technologies are all sort of within the scope of what's going on. And then the third grandiose goal is to, is to survive long enough to get a real sense of what iceberg we are the tip of in terms of all of these trends, right? There, there's, there's a lot that's new and interesting going on in this particular way of, uh, I was going to say doing business, but that's really the point, this, this way of, of getting the job done. And that also could be really quite interesting long term. Jordan, I would like to ask you what some of the uh, technology and materials that you've been working with. I know when you showcased a couple of years ago and last year, you used sugar uh, to print 3D printing structures. Um, but what are some of the you know, other raw materials that you work with currently in your lab? Um, so uh, some, some of the exciting things we get to work with every day is trying to figure out what is the best kind of 3D printing to use for bioprinting? And the answer is that there's really not a best type of technology. So 3D printing additive manufacturing are a huge suite of technologies. You can use lasers to melt metal. You can use light to photo cross-link uh, soft gel. Um, and we are trying to develop each of these different types of technologies in an open way. And each of them could be used for different types of applications. So the harder materials, things made with laser sintering, um, those could be used more for bone scaffolds, um, whereas other things like the one we'll be showing off later tonight uh, is using light projection, where we have a photosensitive gel uh, that has the consistency of jello when it's hardened, and that can match a lot of the compliance of the soft tissues in the body, things like the liver or maybe the lung. Um, and so uh, we are trying to develop uh, technologies that can print many different types of materials. They could also print living cells and not kill them during the printing process. A lot of manufacturing technologies have not been optimized yet for trying to keep cells alive during them. Um, so we're trying to do that as well. Um, and I, I think that uh, a lot of these, are, we're still early in the field. So we're trying to figure out how do we architect the tissues. So one, one of the key challenges in our field is actually trying to get an, an, a sense of the imaging or the architecture of the solid organs. So uh, we're talking about this a little bit today, but the technology that lets you see the trachea of the lung uh, maybe like a CAT scan or an MRI will not let you see the tiniest alveoli in the lung. Uh, the scales are off, and if you, as the vice versa, if you have a technology that can let you see the tiniest alveoli in the lung, you can't see the whole structure. So uh, part of our challenge is trying to identify what are the architectures of the living tissue, what do we need to reconstitute in these uh, new types of, of living tissues that we're, print, that we're printing, and how do we keep these cells alive. Thank you. And on the point of challenges, I want to circle back with Daryl and Matthew to some of the challenges you all face and that you also alluded to in your remarks um, from an agency perspective, um, whether it's you know, with companies or with uh, other agencies that think, again, like you said, you're breaking all the rules and that sort of institutional uh, mindset. But what are some of the challenges you all face uh, with NIH, FDA, and just the government in general? If you're able, if you're able to speak <laughs> about them. So I'll open with that one. So when we originally started looking at additive manufacturing, we realized that you know, there are lots of different technologies. And as Jordan just said, you can use a laser to melt the metal, center a polymer, cure a polymer, lots of different sort of technologies. And it's, we're looking at it and we said, you know, this is going to be a problem for us to understand all of it all at once. So we ended up having a workshop back in October, two days. We had 200 in-person attendees, three to 400 people online. I don't always understand the web metrics. I've had one person on our web team say 400, another one say 300. Lots of involvement from across industry, medical device manufacturers. John was there. We had uh, university professors. We had some drug companies show up and confused why someone from the devices weren't talking about drugs. Uh, and we were able to get some really good feedback and pull a lot of these common issues. You know, if you're using a laser to center a metal a polymer, or cure the polymer, you, know, you still need to understand where that laser is going, how much control you have. So we're able to distill a lot of the sort of common themes from the different technologies to sort of understand the best approach. Uh, many of the hurdles that we had to come overcome our obstacles were uh, somewhat technical uh, in the way that uh, that you do software development in the government, and but but also one of the things that we wanted to really provide people 
the opportunity for was uh, common, uh, what are called Creative Commons licenses to protect their intellectual property. And this is one thing I, I guess we'll hear about this uh, after lunch uh, on the intellectual property panel. But we found that as we got more and more people invested in the exchange, that different people wanted different kinds of protection for their intellectual property. And the kinds of things that we thought would be sufficient ended up not being sufficient. And so we had to add, it was a simple thing, but add, pe add to the choices that we were offering choices for additional license models uh, of intellectual property. I think uh, we had, you know, we, we had several technical hurdles uh, to overcome, but really because of that high-level support, and I think this is the key, key point to drive home here, at least uh, in, in this venue with policymakers, is that by in trying to do something really innovative and something really different, something that hasn't really been done in government before, uh, the, the only way to get it done quickly enough to make a difference and make an impact is to have really high level support. And I guess you get that from being able to uh, very lucidly explain your idea and show the potential impact. And then once you get going, show real impact of, of your idea. Uh, we were fortunate enough to, to be able to do that. Um, not every idea is going to make it that way, but I think in, in a very aggressive entrepreneurial style, uh, you can really make innovative things happen in government if you have that support allowing you to experiment and, and do things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Great, thank you. And you actually transitioned well into the last question I have for the rest of the panel. Um, thank you all very much for naturally transitioning from one flow top to the next. Um, it's better than I could have done. Uh, but I want to ask the rest of you all, what are some things that you want policymakers um, to come away with from this panel to keep in mind? Carol, you already kicked it off. Uh, and then after you all answer that question, I'll open up um, the floor to Q&A for the audience. Actually, questions. I have one, one other thought I wanted to share. Sure, sure. Just very ahead. briefly. And that is, uh, part, one of the goals of the exchange is to be open. All right, the exchange is three things. It's, it's a database of, of <coughs> models, it's a website, and it's a suite of tools that have, you know, allow people to take their scientific data and turn it into 3D prints. All of those need to be open. And we've done that through what's called application programming interfaces or APIs that allow computers to talk to each other so that uh, things can happen more, more quickly and in an automated fashion. Uh, we've made the code available and are making it more and more available uh, through uh, Drupal and GitHub and other sources like this. And, uh, and I think that openness is a, is a key part. Okay. Sean? Um, the kinds of policy issues that we are concerned about. Um, so on the one hand, we've been very lucky, actually, in that we began working in an area that falls within a discretionary category uh, within Matthew's organization. Um, because we're, we're doing, we're giving them away for free, so we don't have some of the uh, product liability concerns. Um, for a while, we said these aren't even medical devices. Some, some of our members use the phrase mechanical costumes. They're body powered for all of these reasons, and they're upper limb prosthetics. Those characteristics actually put us in a sweet a discretionary category, as I understand it, in which um, the regulatory constraints aren't, uh, are, are not onerous at all. But we're going to be adding motors to our limbs. People keep asking for legs. Uh, in some cases, we may want to begin um, charging in certain circumstances, perhaps for medical grade devices. And yet, we are still a grossly underfunded um, <laughs> uh, organization. We have been very um, lucky to get some pro bono legal support, but this is actually keeping a lot of very good lawyers very busy trying to keep up. And so those are concerns. The, the burdens of regulatory um, concerns um, are something we worry about. Here's another example of an issue that we're, that we're, we're wrestling with. We, you know, our biggest concern is to make sure that while we're doing this interesting thing, we do no harm. Um, the device, we've heard about device quality, so we try to make sure that the fabricators are competent, that the devices they produce are uh, reasonably sound, 
that the cases we're giving them to are cases which are suitable for amateurs using consumer grade 3D printers. And we've come to realize that the attorneys um, favored us with this information recently, that the more conscientious we become about this kind of thing, the more liable we may be if something actually goes wrong. Um, right? Because certainly if I share with a crowd like this that we try our best not to, not to do any harm, it sort of implies that you can take one of these devices and be com confident that they're not going to hurt you. And if some kid has a bike accident while wearing one of our hands, we may be more vulnerable for that purpose. The point is, it's a very complicated and confusing environment. And as for as long as we can, we're going to just keep on trying to do the right thing the right way. But these legal and regulatory um, concerns are ones that will slow us down, or screw us up, or shut us down. All right, so I'm not going to directly endorse anything that John just said. But, but I am going to say uh, there are regulatory requirements based on each type of device. Uh, there is an entire uh, Code of Federal Regulation set saying if your device does this and has these characteristics, this is the regulatory landscape. Uh, beyond the federal government, whenever you're making any sort of product, there's also going to be local jurisdictional issues that you also have to comply with. So you know, for the FDA, you know, as everything stands right now, none of our regulations call out you know, method of manufacturing. So whether you're additively manufacturing it, milling, or laving it, our regulations just look at what that final finished device is. And then no matter sort of how you're making it, you know, you're responsible for following those regulations. All right, so uh, just, just to echo uh, what Daryl was talking about, um, definitely openness um, is one of the key things that I think uh, has already been working. So all of the, the mandates and the recommendations by Congress and by various agencies to keep data open, um, you're seeing that have broad waves in the scientific community. Uh, people are getting more actively uh, posting their data, sharing, explaining other people how to reproduce what they've been doing. Um, and then I also to echo uh, John, you know, funding is always a challenge. Um, so I, I do think our field would be able to go faster uh, with more funding. So I think that um, ways in which things can be incentivized for developing new types of bioprinting technologies, showcasing them, talking about it more, getting more people excited. Um, one, one of the really exciting things that, that we've seen is that the, uh, there are about 200,000 3D printers out there in the world. And these are the people that you want to come to science, that you, they have this new technology expertise, that they are the perfect people to come in and make these breakthroughs in the field. So I see this uh, as a really great uh, area of overlap. Thank you. John, are you a brief yeah. follow-up? Yeah, I just thought questions. I would comment on uh, an emerging theme that I'm sure many of you have picked up on, this word open. Um, it and it turns out it, it means lots of different things. On the one hand, we're talking about transparency, just whatever is going on, that will be exposed. We're also talking about open source licensing, that um, what we're doing is, in, is possible because all of the designs and all of the designers have decided to put out their designs as things that other people can pick up, use, modify, download, share, all of that stuff. So there's, there's that kind of open. There's also the social open. Our community um, includes people very much like Jordan, for example, like Jordan yeah, specifically. Um, and it, and it actually, it includes Becky Button, a high school student who has come to our conferences and developed um, interesting techniques, and puppet makers, and HVAC installers, and 10-year-old kids who said, for example, could my hand glow in the dark, which is a really good idea. Um, so we're also open to input and output from all of these different parties, and that's, that's one of the big secrets of our success. Um, in the context of this panel, I'll point out that, you know, when you have kids and amateurs doing the work that used to be that of high-paid, highly trained, and certified professional prosthetists, that, again, creates all sorts of interesting challenges, but these are good problems to have. And I urge everyone in the audience to start addressing them. <laughs> On the note of good problems to have, we are currently at the end of a lot of time for the panel, but I do want to open this up to at least like two or three questions. If we could get two or three questions and some quick responses so we can break for lunch. So I saw 
I had the gentleman in blue, then I had the back, and then the gentleman over there, and then we'll get you right there. So those are the four right now. So you start with the glasses, where's your hand? Well, yes, I was a VP of R&D for a medical device company, and I experienced firsthand the benefits of following and not following the FDA regulations. I won't get into the detail of how we did not follow it. But, but it was amazing uh, how fast we were able to develop it by not following FDA regulations, but then how it crashed eventually long term because the right procedures were not in place with the suppliers in terms of checking and the quality assurance and so forth. So, uh, you know, I, for Enable, I like to, I understand that, but I've experienced both sides. I know you're RIT from RIT, I'm from RPI, we're sort of rivals, but, but I would, I would uh, like to know if you've taken into consideration of at least teaching your community sort of the basic FDA <coughs> regulations, not to hinder, but to actually improve uh, the quality. Uh, a l all, not enough, not as much as you would like, but a little bit. Um, and it's part because they, you know, these are these are volunteers. They're in quickly. They're often out quickly. They're it's short attention span theater in many cases. And right now, those issues have turned out not to be. The FDA regulatory issues have turned out not to be pressing. The liability issues, the, the personal privacy issues, those are ones that are immediately um, important. So those are the ones that we're, we're educating our community about more actively right now. But I think it's coming. Thank you, Russell. Question in the back, Martin? I work for, for Form Labs, and we manufacture 3D printers. And one question that I think keeps coming up that I'd be interested in the panel addressing is where you think the division of responsibility and roles should be or ought to be between manufacturers of 3D printers and then their customers who are using this equipment to do things like prosthetic devices and, and other sorts of actual final medical device uh, manufacture. We've talked about making, from the from the customer's point of view, making sure that the supplies are right, but where do you see the manufacturer's obligations fall? Well, I want to take just a, a quick crack at that and maybe have Matt's response well, or whoever else. Uh, we, we had one of our earliest 3D printers was an old Z-Core machine. And uh, we, you know, this was an $85,000 machine. Uh, we had a one-time grant to get it. We were very lucky. We had money. And then, but then it turns out that there's an $8,000 a year maintenance fee on this <laughs> device. And that's great. We paid that for a while. Uh, and then we came up with an idea of printing what's called a phantom. Isn't that a great word, a phantom? It, it's used in CT to give standards for uh, x-ray dose. Okay, and the, the idea was is that we were going to inject iodine into the printing binder matrix and use that as a way to print features inside of objects that could be then seen in a, in a CT machine. This totally violated all the warranty and everything. And yet, we were able to work with z -Core, and they gave us approval to do this uh, as long as we maintained uh, the, the service contract. And it was all good. So this was an example of how uh, the manufacturer of the device and uh, the, the people using the, the 3D printer were able to work together to accomplish something very innovative and different uh, because there was good communication between them. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's a, a case study. Yeah, I, I would uh, uh, tweak it a little bit. I, I would also I'll actually uh, turn the question a little bit. I, I think a division of labor is okay, but I don't think division of responsibility is what you really want. And I think the only way to get where everybody is understanding everything that's happening is to do it in an open way. So I would encourage you guys to think about having an open source printer that you could share with people. So for example, if you guys change your build platform, from Silicard 184 to Silicard 385, that could have dramatic ramifications for someone printing it for printing an, an organ type uh, system or implant. And those types of information uh, pieces have to be shared with people to be able to make real progress together. So uh, maybe you can do that with uh, contracts and NDAs, and that would be fine too. But I think uh, I would encourage you guys to think more about sharing information and sharing responsibility that way and having more eyes look at the problem and, and finding solutions. Okay, so, sir, you have a question? Okay. Yeah. Um, I've formed a partnership with MakerBot Corporation, and we've built a facility out in Herndon, Virginia, called Monroe Street Studio. It's focused on education around uh, design and 3D printing. 
Um, so this summer, one of our most popular summer camps is building prosthetic hands. Um, I'd say second only, unfortunately, to Minecraft for 3D printing. Um, but my question for all of you, or whoever wants to take it, is, is basically for this generation that's going to grow up with ubiquitous 3D printing in their lives, what should we be teaching them? Um, what, what would you like to see people be learning if they're in the, let's say, 12 to 17 year age range? Uh, so despite being a material scientist and wanting everyone to be able to develop new materials for 3D printers, uh, really it's going to be the 3D design, 3D imaging. Uh, that's where I think there's a lot more room for development. And I think you know, moving forward, especially for medical products, uh, there's going to be a greater demand for understanding how to match a device to a patient's anatomy, how to read complex 3D imaging modalities to determine what size device you need to make for that patient. So, as much as they should all be learning material science, uh, really I think the 3D imaging and 3D design is you know, where you should be focusing on. Um. You know, in addition to the numbers I can cite, there are hundreds or thousands of hands that have been made by what I call enables dark matter. All of these projects that we, if we're lucky, hear about after the fact. Um, there are 55 classrooms that have taken this on. The, my answer to your question would be that while um, using this new technology is a great way to learn about things and it can be really fun, learning to use the technology to change lives and to, pardon the expression, to enable a future is even more fun and even more meaningful. I think what's really interesting about what we're doing is that um, we're attracting, in particular, young girls to this technology because they're sort of interested in the devices, but they're really interested in the notion that these devices can make, make big changes in people's lives. And I think that's a really important thing to kids to learn, especially as we're emphasizing technology learning, which you know can make more problems than it than it solves. <laughs>